Heirlooms in Apex Legends are the most rare, expensive and sought after cosmetic items in the game. However, many of them have complex and fascinating origin stories or interesting lore easter eggs that many people don't know the significance of. In this video I'm going to explore the lore behind every single heirloom in the game to date. The first heirloom in Apex Legends and the first heirloom we will look at today is Wraiths. She put this blade in my hands and my whole life changed. Rafe's real name is Rene Hope Blaisley and she originally worked as an IMC test pilot with Amir Singh in the labs on Kings Canyon working on phase technology looking into the possibility of other parallel dimensions. For a particular experiment Rafe volunteered as a test subject. This experiment went wrong causing memory loss and what was thought to be insanity due to the voices she could hear in her head. Instead of helping her, Singh took advantage of Rafe, performing cruel experiments on her while taking all the credit for the original research for himself. Voidwalker Rafe, who was the original Rafe from the main Apex dimension, at some point escaped and in the Voidwalker stories from the Outlands, she tries to track down Singh by searching through abandoned IMC facility computers. Unfortunately for her plans of revenge, she finds out that Singh is deceased. Immediately after making this discovery, she is caught by soldiers and is forced to flee into the void. While running through the void, Voidwalker notices another Wraith in a separate dimension being tied down by an IMC scientist. Seeing this, Voidwalker calls out through the void. This is where we learn that the voices Wraith hears are actually alternate versions of herself calling out warnings. Frustrated that this Wraith isn't resisting him more, Voidwalker jumps into that reality through a portal. She then uses the kunai to cut the bindings on Wraith's hands, freeing her, before giving the knife to her. Soon after, Wraith and Voidwalker are discovered and get into a fight with lab personnel. During this, a voice warns Wraith that there's danger behind her, behind, behind you. letting her incapacitate the scientist with a kunai. Instead of killing him, she knocks him out, prompting Voidwalker to ask why she didn't kill him and get revenge. Rafe replies that, I'm not looking for revenge. I want to know who I am. When Singh turns up moments later, Voidwalker chooses to stay behind and get her revenge while our Rafe uses the portal device to travel back to the main dimension, ending up in the labs under King's Canyon. Rafe also has three heirloom animations that tie into her story. The first being the voice line I played at the start of this section. She put this blade in my hands and my whole life changed. In the second rather rare animation, you can see Voidwalker handing Rafe the kunai knife. And finally, as one of her inspect animations, she looks at her employee personnel file. This is likely one of the files Mirage pulled out from his mother's old file storage in season six Apex, as she used to work for the IMC. Of particular interest is the photo she has with Watson. Why would Watson be calling Rafe a ghost? Well, that's a crucial detail in the story of the next heirloom I'll be talking about, Watson's. I've seen a lot of people confused about what exactly Watson's heirloom is, with some people comparing it to a Walmart price scanner. However, it actually fits perfectly into Watson's lore. To start with, we know for sure that the heirloom was designed by Watson. In Watson's new POR and Stormpoint, there's lots of memorabilia from Watson's life, and amongst them we can find diagrams for Energy Reader Heirloom. But how is Rafe's story relevant to Watson designing this strange looking device? To understand how, we have to continue on from when Rafe arrived in King's Canyon after the events of Voidwalker's story from the Outlands. During this time period, the Mercenary Syndicate had hired Watson's father, who is an electrical engineer, to work on the electrical systems for the upcoming Apex games. While he worked on the project, the pair lived on King's Canyon and so Watson grew up exploring the island. Despite her father's wishes that she stayed out of the project, Watson started researching solutions for the ring system that be used in the games. Eventually she discovered a 21st century crown control device known as an active denial system that used microwaves to heat the top layers of human skin. This is a real world device by the way. She combined this with a large dome shield that surrounded the island and a smaller one progressively shrinking inside it while the space between was filled with microwaves. Wanting to prove this worked to her dad, she went off alone to the abandoned Singh labs under King's Canyon looking for two dome shields. However, Rafe was in these labs, confused and disorientated as she had just been rescued by Voidwalker and travelled to this dimension. Watson managed to grab two bubble shields but came across Rafe who told her to leave. Rafe's strange void ability scared Watson, making her believe the labs were haunted by a ghost. 
Fleeing with the shields, Watson found a spot out in Kings Canyon to test the idea. Despite a raging thunderstorm that had developed and her rubber insulating shoes being lost earlier while she escaped the labs. The experiment went quite well, up until a lightning bolt slammed into a generator, badly electrocuting Watson and setting the forest around her on fire. If you played early seasons of Apex, the large burnt region of the map was caused by that fire. Rafe, who had followed her, rescued her and took her back to her father. Rafe quickly left after and Watson, not knowing who had saved her, referred to her saviour as her ghost, referenced in the Rafe animation I mentioned earlier. But how does this all relate to Watson's heirloom? If you find a ghost, who are you going to call? People who are familiar with the Ghostbusters films will know about the psychokinetic energy meter. This could be used to detect and track ghosts using their energy. Of particular interest is the version from the animated Ghostbusters television series. You might notice a striking similarity between this and Watson's heirloom, especially in this animation. Another device that has an interesting similarity to the heirloom is the motion tracker from the Alien series. I don't think these similarities are a coincidence. The energy reader heirloom design is likely a nod to other similar devices in other fictions. <laughs> it's likely Watson developed the energy reader device right after Rafe saved her while she was still unaware who Rafe was, intending to track down the strange ghost from the abandoned labs who saved her. This device was of course useful for more than just ghost hunting, and so she carries it in the Apex games. Maybe she can even pick up the energy signatures produced by the armor worn by the legends. Of course, this is just speculation as you cannot do this with the heirloom. If you could, it would be incredibly pay to win. The second heirloom to come to Apex after Wraiths is Bloodhound's Raven by Axe. Like Wraiths, this heirloom is a story from the Outlands which prominently features it. Bloodhound's parents were engineers working on New Dawn, a cooling plant on the planet Talos for a mining operation. Their uncle Arta also lived on Talos, however he belonged to a community that rejected all technology. Unfortunately there was a disaster at the cooling plant causing a flash freeze event that killed both of Bloodhound's parents, with their father tragically dying in front of them. Now an orphan, Bloodhound was taken in by their uncle Arta's community and taught their old ways, a belief system taken from Norse mythology. At the age of 10, Bloodhound was given the task to gain full acceptance into the tribe, killing a prowler armed only with an axe, the Raven's Bite heirloom. Finding that the prowler had already been killed, the young Bloodhound follows the blood trail into an abandoned factory tunnel. Finding a discarded charge rifle, Bloodhound picks it up. However, they alert the Goliath that lived in the tunnel. In a panic, they manage to fire the charge rifle, seemingly killing the Goliath in a single shot. Bloodhound's uncle's crow sees this and flies off to report it to the uncle. Bloodhound buries the charge rifle to hide it, but when they try to present the Goliath's horn to their uncle, they reject it and tell Bloodhound that Oh, you chose an exile. As Bloodhound leaves, suddenly the Goliath arrives alive and very angry. Frantically digging up the charge rifle, Bloodhound calls a warning, attracting the Goliath's rage and getting the charge rifle smashed. Arta comes to the rescue, fighting with the beast using the Raven's Bite axe, but is tossed against a tree, mortally injuring him. Bloodhound grabs the charge rifle power core and throws it at the Goliath, and the explosion finally drives it off. Dying, Arta gives a very emotional speech to young Bloodhound, before giving the heirloom to them. You will be the first, Bluthondor, the old father, guides. You now. Bloodhound then returns to the tunnel to finish the Goliath off, using the heirloom to break open the coolant pipes to freeze the Goliath. Unfortunately, Bloodhound is caught in the coolant and only just manages to survive by grabbing a respirator that had been left in the tunnel. Bloodhound shatters the frozen Goliath with the heirloom, but the coolant had permanently damaged their face and lungs, leading to them wearing a breathing apparatus to this day. The next heirloom is Lifeline Shock Sticks, which combined two of the most important things in our life. Lifeline was born to the owners of Chevrex, a corporation that specializes in drones, in particular weaponized drones. While the company liked to present a polished image, they sold to both sides of conflicts for generations, making enormous profits. Lifeline growing up was unaware of this, but when she learned the truth that her family were war profiteers, she ran away. You have blood on your hands, mother. 
I won't be a part of this family. She travelled with Octane to Solus, where he had one of his gauntlet competitions. Octane was friends of the band Flyer Liars, who are on the planet. Hearing them play live, Lifeline was awestruck. Quickly becoming friends of the band members, she stayed with them while Octane travelled on to the next crazy competition. While hanging out with the band, Lifeline picked up the drums, finding that she loved playing. Soon, she was filling in for them when the drummer couldn't make a gig. After the band went to Plasmeef, her home planet, to do a relief fundraiser gig run by the humanitarian organisation Frontier Corps, she saw the downtrodden and poor on her own planet for the first time. The contrast between them and the life of luxury her family enjoyed made her swear off her family for good and join the Corps helping those in need. While Lifeline moved on from the band to the Corps and eventually the Apex Games to raise funds for the Frontier Corps, her love of drums has clearly stayed with her. Her town takeover even has a room underneath with a drum set and Flyer Liar posters. The Shock Sticks heirloom combines both her love of drums from her time with the Flyer Liars and her medical work with the Frontier Corps as they're designed to be defibrillator sticks as you can see on the side of the heirloom. If you pay any attention to Pathfinder, you'll know he loves one spot in particular. With finisher moves, the town takeover, and of course an heirloom all dedicated to boxing, it's obvious how much he enjoys it. But where did Pathfinder's boxing obsession come from? While on the search for his creator, Pathfinder would do many odd jobs, usually ending in disaster. Eventually he would end up working at a restaurant as a waiter. Showing his usual incompetence, he managed to anger a mobster. This escalated into the mobster shooting Pathfinder, only for the bullet to ricochet off Pathfinder's metal casing back to the mobster killing them. Pathfinder then had the brilliant idea of grabbing the gun. When security turned up, they saw someone shot and Pathfinder holding a gun. The security guard dragged him off for questioning, thinking he was the culprit. This security guard was an ex-cop known as Victor Maldera. He had taken this job after getting fired for obsessing over the already closed case of Alexander Knox, who was presumed dead in a lab fire. Maldera thought that Knox had caused and survived the fire. Of course, we know that Maldera was right, as Knox is caustic. Maldera was also a boxing enthusiast, even having a photo with the fighting legend Forge. While he questioned Pathfinder, the boxing gloves caught Pathfinder's attention. Maldera learned that in Pathfinder's internal memory there was a recording of Knox in the lab fire as Pathfinder had been cleaning the window while the place burned down. When the local mob showed up, Maldera wanted to hang on to Pathfinder for evidence in the Knox case and so used his boxing skills to escape, impressing Pathfinder greatly. Pathfinder clearly never forgot the amazing skills of his friend Maldera and has been enjoying boxing ever since, resulting in his boxing glove heirloom being given to him at some point. While Octane's heirloom knife hasn't directly been referenced in any lore, butterfly knives are clearly something Octane greatly enjoys, and a different butterfly knife shows up in the Quest comic for Season 7, Family Portrait. Here, Octane can be seen playing with the knife in the background, practicing tricks until he injures himself and Lifeline has to heal him. Butterfly knives fit perfectly with Octane's personality, as there is something that both require high skill to do tricks with and are quite dangerous. Octane's enjoyment of skill and danger is best evidenced by his famous gauntlet run where he blew his own legs off with a grenade to set a new record. The other aspect of Octane's heirloom is the stim, which is manufactured by Silver Pharmaceuticals, the corporation which Octane's family runs. The heirloom contains a vial of stim which he uses to inject himself in his inspect animation before enjoying the rush of the drug flowing through him. Stim, as you might have realised from the name, is a stimulant drug. Originally and famously used as a combat drug by pilots in Titanfall, it gives a boost to speed and health regen to pilots who use it. Octane has abused this drug to the extent he takes a large enough dose that it actually damages him. He needs a dialysis machine attached to his belt to remove the excess stim from his blood. Instead, the residual stim in his body seems to heal him slowly on a constant basis. While Octane's heirloom is clearly designed to fit his love of danger, the fact it contains stim which he injects for a rush also shines a light on his addictive personality which has led to his extreme stim addiction. At face value, Mirage comes across as cocky and all about himself, and his heirloom is just another symptom. However, if you take another look, all is not as it seems. Oh, this is just great. Mom's gonna love this. From voice lines and other lore, it's quite clear Mirage cares about his mother a great deal. While he grew up, she was an only parent taking care of four boys as the father was absent most of the time. Young Mirage found he didn't really fit in with his brothers. They enjoyed sport and music while he had no talent for that. Instead, he learned to goof around and try and draw attention to himself. 
One thing he did have talent for was holographic technology. His mother was a brilliant holographic engineer and taught him how to tinker with the technology. As they grew older, Mirage's three brothers all went off to fight the Outland Civil War. They left Mirage and his mother at home, working together on holotech. The house once filled with noise and laughter suddenly was strangely quiet. Then one day they got horrible news. All three brothers had been declared missing in action after their ship went down. This tragedy affected both Mirage and his mother deeply. Worse, his mother started showing signs of dementia soon after. When the Apex Games started, Mirage wanted to join looking for fame and success. However, he was worried about leaving his mother. When he discussed it with her, she encouraged him to follow his dreams, even helping him with a custom set of holo devices. Tragically, his mother's condition would continue to deteriorate, as we can gather from a phone call easter egg that was placed near a Mirage Voyage and World's Edge. Hey, get this. They asked me to take over the games for a bit during the holidays. It makes sense, you know, I mean, give the fine people of the Outlands what they want, right? Yeah. Th yeah, that's right, Mom. Yeah, I I'm your son. Elliot. Yeah, yeah, of course, don't worry. I I'll win for you today, always for my number one fan. When Mirage Voyage returned to King's Canyon, there was another message, this time from Mirage's mum. In part of it, she talks about her failing memory. I don't have an answer. My brain's just... I, I think it's a thing. Whatever you call it. I heard this happens. It, it, it happens to people. I'm tired. As he plays, Mirage tries to create the biggest spectacle, have the largest personality and become the best in the Apex games. Not just to forget the pain he's been through, but to help his mother remember him and feel proud of her son for just a little longer. At first glance, Caustic's sledgehammer heirloom might seem simple, a brutal weapon for a brutal character. But there's more to this weapon than you might expect. The first thing is the design, which looks suspiciously like a simulacrum head. Simulacra like Revenant and Ash are human minds and machine bodies, making them functionally immortal. Caustic at one point worked for Vincent Dynamics, the company that rebuilt Ash's robotic body after the events of Titanfall 2. Caustic wanted to undergo the process as well. Unfortunately for him, but probably fortunately for everyone else, he was rejected due to his lack of empathy amongst other things. There's actually a Simulacrum Caustic skin in the game with a lore note discussing this. The Simulacrum-like design on his hammer is likely a reference to this part of Caustic's past. The reason for Caustic wanting to become a Simulacrum is due to his sickness. Caustic has cancer, a cancer that should have killed him by now. Interestingly, this cancer relates to the second lore feature of the hammer, this rare spider animation you get. At first glance, this just seems to be a creepy fun addition. However, in the Legacy Antigen comic, we learn that Caustic is taking a substance that can be harvested from a particular species of spider. This substance is an antidote to his gas. It also prevents the cancer from spreading and killing him. Nearly 200 years before Gibraltar was born, his family founded the Search and Rescue Association of Solus, a volunteer humanitarian organisation. The family has continued to run it ever since, and Gibraltar grew up with a father who volunteered in the organisation. When the Outland Civil War broke out, Gibraltar disagreed with the isolationist response of his family and the organisation, and ran away at the age of 14, finding a job working at the old Thunderdome in Solar City. There he would meet Nick, both working cleaning and stocking the markets. The two would grow close and form a relationship. When the Thunderdome shut down a few years later, Gibraltar convinced Nick to join the war. Gibraltar snuck back home and stole his father's old motorcycle and picked Nick up. While travelling over the nearby mountains, a thunderstorm rolled in and they crashed on the slippery roads. His father got called out with a team to rescue them, but the rain triggered a mudslide while they were being rescued and this cost his dad his arm. After being rescued, they were questioned about what happened and Nick took responsibility for stealing the bike. Nick's parents wanted him to learn his lesson and sent him to a juvenile delinquency centre. Unfortunately, this set Nick on a bad path and the two lost track of each other and drifted apart. Years later, while Gibraltar played in the Apex games, they would meet again. In the Family Portrait Quest story, we learn that Nick had the War Club custom made for him while they were still together. Gibraltar still feels a lot of guilt over what happened and has kept the War Club as a reminder, using it as his heirloom in the Apex games. Growing up, Bangalore was very close with her family, in particular her brother Jackson. When the frontier war between the IMC and the frontier militia broke out, both signed up to fight. 
Jackson ended up becoming commanding officer of the ship Bangalore was deployed with. Eventually they would fight in the battle for Gridoran. The fight for this planet went very badly for the IMC, losses mounted and a whole fleet deserted. Bangalore was injured in the fighting and while she was in recovery, her brother decided that Gridoran was lost and it was in their best interest to leave. Bangalore had to be sedated as she did not want to desert and would have started a coup. Using up a special energy source allowed them to cut a decades long trip to the Outlands into a year. There Bangalore woke to find the ship had crash landed on Storm Point with the survivors settling into a local settlement. Furious at the desertion, she sent an emergency signal out. This got the attention of an IMC commander who upon arrival attempted to execute Bangalore's brother for treason. Bangalore intervened, attacking the pilot. Working together with Jackson, she managed to disable the pilot's jump pack and then kill him with his own knife. They would then commandeer the commander's ship, travelling the outlands and doing odd jobs. Bangalore kept the pilot's knife, later using it as an heirloom in the Apex games. The knife also has a second piece of lore, the bottle caps on the knife sheath. These are part of a famous tradition by the Williams family where on the morning before deployment the family would share a last round of beers and then fashion the bottle caps into a bracelet. These would be a memento to remind them that the family was always together no matter the distance between them. We don't know exactly when or how Revenant got his heirloom, however we do know it was manufactured by Hammond Robotics as it has a Hammond Robotics logo on the side which has been partly scratched off. Hammond Robotics is the company that built Revenant. Originally Revenant was a human hitman used by the Syndicate but after a particularly nasty job he was killed in revenge. Unwilling to lose such a valuable hitman and seeing an opportunity, the Syndicate along with Hammond Robotics used his mind to create Revenant. Originally Hammond installed an ego retention system which made Revenant see himself as human and caused him to mentally ignore inconsistencies that would arise from having an inhuman robot body. This would work perfectly for the Syndicate for nearly 300 years. Every time one of his robotic bodies was destroyed, Hammond could just have blowed his mind to a new one. This all fell apart when he went on a job to kill a notorious thief and Loba's father, Marcos Andrade. After the job, Revenant noticed something was wrong. A large shard of glass was sticking into his neck. This had damaged the ego retention system. When he pulled the shard out, the illusion shattered and he was suddenly bombarded with memories of countless deaths over the years. This was incredibly painful and Revenant basically concluded that existence was pain. Following this he went on a killing spree targeting the Syndicate and Hammond Robotics. Soon he realised that unfortunately all those who had built him were long dead and thus unkillable. The Syndicate then managed to redirect his murderous path into the Apex games. However he still harbours a deep hatred for Hammond Robotics which has clearly led him to scratching over the symbol on his heirloom, probably in a fit of rage at some point since he seems to have done a pretty bad job of it. The other interesting thing about this heirloom is that it's got a shadow particle effect on the blade. Revenant has had shadow power since before he woke up to the truth, so clearly these were given to him by Hammond. A shadow dimension has featured in several limited time modes and was where Ash's head was retrieved from. It seems likely Hammond knew about the shadow dimension and used it to give Revenant his powers. His scythe may have been an early experiment from that time, maybe as a test to see if the shadow power could be weaponized. Finally Revenant has this animation where he holds up Forge's medallion, who was murdered by Revenant during a live broadcast by Outlands Television. Forge was introduced as an upcoming legend sponsored by Hammond Robotics in Season 4. Revenant clearly took issue with Hammond sponsoring a legend. <laughs> Rampart is a skilled tinkerer and mechanic. Her custom built weapons are known around the Outlands and several of the legendary reactive battle pass weapon rewards were built by her, such as the famous flatline skin and the wingman. Her wingman even features in Pathfinder's stories from the Outlands. A modified 50 cal rampart, made for murder. Exciting! Not only that, but she built her minigun ultimate Sheila and completely rebuilt her North Star Titan for Valkyrie, turning it into a jetpack to use in game. Rampart is clearly incredibly skilled at what she does. While this heirloom doesn't have any direct lore story or reference, it does make sense for her to build a custom wrench to use on her projects and to help her tune up her minigun, maybe sometimes even Octane's legs in game. The combination of Rampart being so good at building things and the fun little features the heirloom has such as the bubblegum dispenser make it pretty certain that this was built by Rampart for Rampart. 
Mmm, my favorite flavor. Your mom's tears. Mmm. <laughs> Crypto is a big fan of puzzles and interesting security features and his heirloom is no exception. At first glance the handle might look like a strange marriage between a combination lock and VR controller, however this makes for quite an interesting locking device. In several of the heirloom inspect animations we can see him manipulating the combination lock while at the same time moving the joystick on the handle of his blade. Different combinations paired with different joystick movements seem to unlock different features. For example this one which unlocks a green energy discharge. One of these combinations unlocks a secret compartment in the base of the handle which contains this photo of Crypto's sister along with their mother Katrina Knox. This is the same photo you can see him grab in his stories from the Outlands. Crypto's mother was an orphanage owner and adopted Crypto and her sister. Interestingly she did have one real child, Alexander Knox, making Crypto brothers with Caustic. There isn't much information about the origin of the heirloom itself, however judging from the controller like nature of the handle it's possible that it's an upgraded toy from his past life, sort of like the drone controller he uses. Valkyrie's heirloom lore all comes from three of its animations. Unfortunately there doesn't seem to be any lore around the weapon itself. The easiest to trigger lore animation is the helmet that gets pulled out if you inspect while crouching. This helmet should be immediately familiar to Titanfall fans as it comes from one of the most difficult bosses of the game, Viper. Luda 1, Viper's on station. Your journey ends here, pilot. The skies belong to me. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Viper was a highly skilled Titan pilot and member of the Apex Predator mercenary group who used a modified North Star Titan and was also Valkyrie's father. This means that every time you do a playthrough of Titanfall 2's campaign, you get to kill Valkyrie's dad. I've lost the hatch. Need cover, need cover. Cooper, aim for the cockpit. Sixteen years after her dad's death, Valkyrie got a smuggling job from Cuban Blisk, the leader of the Apex Predators. The job was to retrieve the wreckage of Viper's North Star Titan from the floating debris field that was all that remained of the planet Typhon after the events of Titanfall 2. While recovering the North Star she recovered her father's corpse along with his helmet. The heirloom also has a super rare melee animation where you use the helmet to bash the enemy which is sort of weird knowing it's a dead dad's helmet. The third lore related animation is a rare sprinting pullout animation. In it Valkyrie pulls out an Apex Predator card. These cards were given out by Cuban Blisk as an invitation to the Apex Predator mercenaries. Later when the Apex games started he continued using these cards as an invitation to the games. Valkyrie received this card at the end of her stories from the Outlands video where she confronted Blisk about her father's death. After this conversation she tasked Rampart with using Viper's North Star scrap to build her a custom jetpack, which she now uses in the Apex games. Loba was born as the only child to Alanza and Marcus Andrade who are high class thieves. After Marcus had stolen a particularly valuable item he treated his wife and daughter to a meal at Tenmi, a prestigious restaurant in Olympus. Unfortunately for them, the person who Marcus had stolen from had placed a high bounty on them through the mercenary syndicate. The syndicate sent Revenant to complete the job, who climbed the tower where the restaurant was located and murdered both of Loba's parents in front of her. Loba spent the rest of her childhood in a foster home. During this time she turned to thievery just like her parents. During one heist she saved a man called Jamie from some thugs. The two became close friends and partners in crime. During a job of Jamie stealing two highly valuable gems from an auction house she was distracted by a fan in a case. Examining it she quickly realised that it was the same one that had been owned by her mother. When she tried to break it out of the case an unusual security system tangled her preventing her from removing her hand in the fan. The auction house owner then arrived revealing that when he learned who the fan had belonged to he used it to set a trap for Loba. Channeling peak villain energy, the auction house owner severely underestimated Loba, resulting in him getting smacked in the head and his goons defeated. Not having had enough, he gets up and makes a move from behind Loba, only to get smashed in the face by Jamie who has stolen his gem and come to help. Sometime later Loba mentions how she gotten a replica made of the fan with some modifications. 
Judging by how easily the fan can chop through oh. Revenant's head in this inspect animation, it's safe to say these modifications are quite lethal for anyone trying to fight Loba. Yeah. <laughs> she also mentions the heist in this animation. This one may have been my finest heist. Seer has an incredible looking heirloom, however there's a problem. Despite Seer's stories from the Outlands being amazing, the lore has never really been fleshed out and brought to the same level as other legends and his heirloom is no exception. Apart from some drawing animations showing moths which are related to his lore, there isn't any lore at all for the heirloom. This makes Seer the only legend with zero heirloom lore. Respawn, please add some more actual good lore for Seer. He has incredible potential and it all seems wasted right now. Horizon's heirloom and how she built it is directly related to a field of scientific research and the story of how she came to play in the Apex games. Lillian Peck, a philanthropist in the Outlands, brought attention to the fact that there would be an energy crisis within 20 years due to limited resources. Horizon, then known as Dr. Mary Summers, while working on this problem, discovered the element Branthium. This is an extremely potent energy source with one catch. It could only be found naturally in the accretion disks of black holes. After developing her drone Newt, Summers and her assistant Ashley Reed traveled to a black hole to extract some of this element. After successfully capturing the element using Newt and relaying it to the main ship, Summers was betrayed by Reed who left her for dead in close proximity to the black hole. Fortunately, Summers was able to survive in the small spacecraft. However, being stranded this close to the immense gravity of a black hole has a strong dilation effect on time, leading to over a year passing in the outside world for every three days Summers spent in this environment. After 246 days, or 87 years, passing in the outside world, Summers managed to use Branthium to create a portal and escape. Of course, after 87 years, many things had changed, including his son Newton passing. Wanting to keep a promise to her son that she would return, Summers decided to join the Apex Games to fund research into time travel. She retooled Newt to hold a micro black hole to use as a weapon in the games. She also used her knowledge of black holes to build the heirloom and it seems to have been quite a project as it took her longer than it did to build Newt. Took some time to make this one. Even longer than you, Newtie. As you can see, it's actually powered by a shard of Branthium in the base, which demonstrates the ridiculous amounts of energy this heirloom must use to manipulate the micro black hole. After Ashley Reed betrayed Horizon and returned, the group of scientists working on Branthium continued working with Reed, not knowing she was the cause of the tragedy. During this time, Newton, Horizon's son, grew to see Reed as a mentor figure, unaware she was the one who had trapped his mother. Newton would tag along with Reed as she trained at the gym with various weapons. Inspired by her, at age 14 he convinced Lily and Peck to buy him a pair of expensive nunchucks. However, he gave up training with them after hitting himself in the face twice. Later he would join the research group working on Bramphium as an intern, despite Reed's protests. Just before joining, he brought over a box of old stuff that he thought Reed might be able to use. In the box were the nunchucks. When it came time to put the final step of the Apex Predator plan to steal the Bramphium into action, Reed would dismiss Newton early, sparing him from the violence that would follow. Go on. Take the night off. All right. See you tomorrow. Clear. Bring the team in. As Ash now uses the same nunchucks as an heirloom in the Apex games, it's safe to say she still holds a soft spot for Newton, despite having been rebuilt into a simulacrum after being stabbed during the attempted seizure of the Branthium. The last heirloom and the latest released at the time of this video is Fuses, and it has deep significance for his story along with Mad Maggie and Bloodhound. To understand this heirloom, we need to go back to Fuses' childhood. The planet Fuse and Mad Maggie grew up on is Selvo, a planet that was ruled by warlords for at least 50 years. Growing up, Fuse and Mad Maggie became best friends, with a golden grenade they had found becoming the symbol of their friendship. Fuse's parents seemed to have had a troubled relationship, often fighting, and one night while they argued, Mad Maggie came over with a guitar to help cheer Fuse up. Fuse would keep this guitar as a treasured possession. 
Eventually, after they grow up, they started drifting apart due to different goals. Maggie became fully invested in the independence of Salvo, while Fuse was drawn into the world of blood sports, becoming a record-breaking competitor in the Salvo Bone Cage competition. When Salvo joined the Syndicate, Fuse was selected to join the Apex Games. Furious with what she saw as betrayal, Maggie confronted Walter, eventually pulling the pin on the Golden Grenade, resulting in Fuse losing his arm. During Fuse's entrance celebration to the Apex Games, Maggie sabotaged it, causing chaos. As her disruptions to the games continued, Fuse attempted to stop her, but this culminated with her falling from a building and Fuse presuming her dead. While in the Apex Games, Bloodhound and Fuse started developing feelings as they fought together. Amusingly, it took Vantage to point out the obvious romantic tension they had before they seriously discussed their feelings. Sometime later, Walter took the old guitar that Maggie gave him and smashed it to symbolise throwing away his past and all the baggage it held, before asking Bloodhound if they want to move in together. Later, after they moved in together, Fuse heard guitar music in his house. Investigating, he found Bloodhound teaching themselves to play, and they had put together the old guitar into something new, creating it as an anniversary gift. The new guitar symbolised how Fuse's past brought them together and made something new. Judging by how Fuse uses it to smack things, it's pretty much indestructible. Lived a lot of places. Never felt home till I met you, Houndy. And that's it. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. 